Hello and welcome. Just four days ago, a huge controversy erupted in the Danish parliament, and I cannot wait to hear my guests' thoughts on that in a minute. Kirsten Tistel is an associate professor at Copenhagen University Department of Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies. She focuses on minority and majority relations and post-colonial relations. She is particularly interested in how such asymmetric power relations are negotiated through literature and other aesthetic expressions. And she has a deep knowledge of Scandinavia and Greenland. My name is Desiree Orbeck, and I'm a former lecturer at Scandinavian Studies Department at University of Washington. Um, National Danish Book Club and Literary Event Series stands on two legs. We have a book club hosted by Anita Smith and interviews hosted by me. To see more conversations and to follow the book club, please go to northwestdanish.org. And back to Kirsten Tista. Um, some of her research includes words like identities and belonging, emotional communities, rep representation, cultural memory and forgetting, oral traditions and written literature, images of the female body, um, then Danish Greenlandic relations, uh, Greenlandic literature, media and film. And Kirsten, I looked at your bio in order to prepare for this interview and it's very impressive. I cannot do it justice here if we are going to have any time for our conversation, but I highly encourage our viewers to go and do their own research. Um, welcome, Kirsten. Thank you. Is there anything you would like to add that you feel is important for our viewers to know? Oh, I think it's fine. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the, the, the thing that just erupted at the parliament four days ago um, on Friday, where a Danish Greenlandic parliamentarian did something. Would you take it from here and explain? <laughs> yeah, I even found a picture. I watched it and uh, I took a screen dump. So I'll show you what we're talking about. Here she is. Uh, did I get it on? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. She is called um, Aga Matilde Høydam. And uh, what she did was uh, she gave her speech uh, about the, uh, you know, the Danish Riesfællesskab, we call it, the Danish Greenlandic Faroese Commonwealth, or the community of the realm, I prefer to call it. Anyway, they had a discussion on that topic, and she decided to give that, uh, to give her presentation in Greenlandic. Uh, in Greenlandic called Galatlisut. That is the name of the language. Uh, uh, the, the, the country is called Galatlit Nunat in, in Greenlandic. And she simply spoke Greenlandic during the entire presentation. And then uh, when uh, the floor was opened for questions, she still she kept answering in Greenlandic. And it felt to the politicians, you know, very awkward because <clears throat> They know her. She's been in the Danish parliament for many years, and she is fluent in Danish. She's completely bilingual. So, so people thought, what is this performance? What, mm -hmm. what is it good for? But the effect was that uh, she made the Danish politicians feel this awkward sensation of not understanding what's going on that that her fellow Greenlanders experience every day because yeah. Danish is still within the community of the realm, the, the majority language, the language of power and so on. And even inside Greenland, there are so many occasions where if you don't understand Danish, you're, you really don't understand what's going on. 
So she gave them a lecture that they could really feel. And of course, she could have asked on beforehand for an interpreter. But then we wouldn't have been talking about this now, right? Mm -hmm. So she really, this is all that people have been talking about for the last days. So she yeah, made the point. It even reached uh, us here in Seattle. I mean, uh, it was it's um, and, and people are commenting, and now uh, political parties have are, are talking about changing their policies. And um, so, yeah, because and you you use the word performance because as, if I understand it correctly, she's actually born in Denmark, like the the location Denmark, not. Um, but as you can see when you watch this picture, that is also one of the reasons I wanted to, to show this picture. Yeah. Uh, many people will say, hey, is she Inuit? Because people think that there is a connection between the way you look mm -hmm. and the way you speak and the way you feel the ethnicity you feel. But this is not the case in Greenland because everything is so mixed and, and the history is so com complex. So you can easily look like this, uh, very much like a Dane or a European, yeah. and 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 feel very, you know, feel that you're a Greenlander and be completely bilingual also. So these things do not follow one another. Absolutely. And so, I mean, if we broaden it out a little bit in the Muslim community in, Den in Denmark, a lot of people also have issues with like looking different than the traditional, I guess, uh, Danish blonde, blue eyed person and people feeling completely Danish, um, although their heritage might not, you know, go back many generations. So it's interesting that it's such a big theme with Greenlanders, since I feel like there's been a parallel discussion with the Muslim community. Do you see what I'm saying? But the Muslim community is in a um, totally different position because they are migrants to Denmark. Yeah. And yeah. we don't have a colonial relation mm -hmm. to Muslims in Denmark like they have in England or the yeah. other colonial power uh, powers who, who have a long colonial relationship with these countries. Denmark does not. So our colonial relationship is especially to um, to the Greenlandic people and uh, to the Faroese, but, but the Faroese have never been racialized because they are, they are Norse people. Mm -hmm. so, so they can't be uh, racially distinguished from Danes. So, and, and things are very different with yeah. the Faroe Islands, actually, uh, because the Greenlanders were seen as, uh, you know, a people of nature, uh, which used to be the primitive people. That there's still this, um, uh, yeah, racialized discussion yeah. about the Greenlanders that we don't have about. Uh, 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 the Faroe Islands. Yeah. It's very interesting because apparently we treat people with this, like they have Danish nationality and Greenlandic um, culture, and then yeah. we don't see them as equals. But I no. mean, I'm, I'm di diverting a little bit from my questions, but it's it's just, it's extremely interesting, I think. Yeah, but that was the whole point. The, 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 I think the whole problem was that, you know, back in 1953, when uh, it was decided that uh, Greenland should not be a colony anymore, mm. uh, and that Greenland was integrated in Denmark, uh, they were made like, you know, an equal part of Denmark, uh, the northernmost county of Denmark. But the whole problem was that that was never really the intention because the Danes still saw them as this vulnerable people of nature that needed help and guidance and so on. So, so the, the colonial power, the colonial structure that just, you know, continued into the next generations. Mm -hmm. So between 1953 and up until home rule in 1979, Many Greenlanders say that this is the heyday, actually, of Danish colonialism in Greenland, because wow. then so many Danes came and the Danes kind of took over. Before, it was always understood that, it, that Greenland was the land of the Greenlanders and the Danes were there in small numbers just to help the population. But suddenly, you know, it was flooded before. 1953, Greenland was completely closed. You couldn't go there and you couldn't leave there if you didn't have a permission because you needed to have a you know spot on the on the ships. Mm -hmm. uh, but now the, the country was opened up 
uh, for for uh, business initiatives and so on, and mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, did not go so well as some of the Greenlandic politicians who who had actually wanted this, like they had hoped for. They had feared that what happened would happen, and they had hoped for a real integration. But since that integration did not happen, then they went for home rule. Yeah. So it's been kind of very successful. Uh, the, the, the political um, history of Greenland is very successful, I think, because then they got home rule and then they got uh, self-government and now they, are, they want something called free association, which they will probably also get. So they get more and more power, more and more self-governance. Uh, 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 yeah, it's, um, it's very interesting. Um, and hopefully they can uh, pick something that fits with their culture and um, without having a, to go through too much um, pain as it is already. Um, I would like to ask you something else because um, preparing for this interview, I kept going back to the same question. Um, how do we tell the story? And it, it seems very simple, but there are so many layers to this. Like, um, how does narration matter? Um, and um, what is an agenda? And then when there is an agenda, and in this case with multiple cultural aspects, like how how is the story shaped by that? And, you know, it ties into what you just said about building a, a, a society, building a, a political system, building an administration from the ground up um, or from the top down. I don't even know uh, how it, if they do both. But so how does, how we tell stories and who listens matter? But the thing is that, you know, we always talk about in Denmark, we always talk about Greenland and Denmark's shared history. But the fact is that we don't really have a shared history. We have entangled histories. Mm. But the narratives that we tell from a Greenlandic point of view and from a Danish point of view, those two narratives, they are so uh, different that we can't talk about a shared history. And, and that is one of the things that we need to learn because of course it matters who's telling the story, who's doing the representation, who has the power to represent mm -hmm. and as it is or as it has been until recently. The Danes have had the power to represent the Greenlanders. Uh, that uh, goes far out of Greenland to to a Danish public, but also out of Denmark to the uh, to to the outer world, mm -hmm. uh, both as concerns politics, but also like uh, a very famous uh, novel like Peter Hoes' Miss Miller's Sense of Snow. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, uh, those literary works. They are. Uh, where many people get the information about a place like Greenland. Mm -hmm. And that uh, novel does not necessarily communicate a picture that the Greenlanders would choose to, to, uh, to paint. So mm -hmm. therefore it's also so um, uh, such a good thing, so encouraging that uh, uh, the Greenlanders are now, uh, uh, they have a great success with both film and uh, music and, and, uh, and, and literature but also yeah. uh, writing history. Yeah. They also, they want to write their own history now because up until now it's been written by, by Danish historians. Mm -hmm. So now, now uh, they really, they want to represent themselves. And, and uh, the way that, uh, that these literary works like uh, Nivia Cornelius's uh, uh, books have been, uh, have been read and discussed in Denmark, uh, tell something about this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting because I mean, for a long time it's been Imleine, Naya Marie Eid, um, those are, um, even Montrop, right? Um, people with a knowledge of Greenland, but maybe not. I mean, we'll talk about this later. What mm -hmm. what is Greenlandic literature, and who can does it matter? Who can represent, and and in what way, right? Um, but before we get to that, just to to go back to uh, Nivia Cornelius and. Mm -hmm. And the, she kind of, um, in this book and her previous work, um, there is 
uh, she she um, works around the theme of shame and being Greenlandic while also being Greenlandic Danish heritage. Um, could you say something about that? Yeah. Did you see my new uh, pictures here? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, yes, yeah, she. Um, this is the. Uh, uh, this is a cover. Uh, uh, I think this is the probably the Danish. Yeah, this is the Danish version, but the title is the same in in uh, in Greenlandic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she's. Uh, I mean, uh, you see this picture with this woman who's probably uh, having a little hangover from yesterday. <laughs> a banana and uh, not wearing any clothes and she's not a pinup she's a natural ordinary woman um yeah uh, at the uh, same time it's very sexualized right and we know that, that she's a queer woman so it's, it's there are so many interesting things going on in that picture yeah uh, but i think that when nivia cornelius wrote this novel she was not uh, she was not trying to write a, a post-colonial novel or discuss, you know, danish Greenlandic relations. She wrote this novel for her own generation in Nook. Mm -hmm. uh, for years, people have been longing to have these uh, texts and film and so on that goes on in Nook with the young generation because uh, uh, former previous generations, they have been very uh, focused on uh, the hunting culture, you know, the cultural heritage and so on, yes. due to nation building reasons. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, uh, Danish uh, uh, films about Greenland, uh, it's always something about this uh, uh, modern, uh, hectic, uh, overworked uh, Danish person uh, coming to Greenland to find themselves out yeah. in the big nature, you know, yeah. in all the peace and so on. Uh, so people wanted Nook, the capital of Greenland, put on the map. And they got this with this novel. And it's um, uh, it highlights all the, you know, ambiguities and problems and uh, things you cannot solve and so on. And still, it's a very, it's a very positive book mm -hmm. because uh, it's, uh, uh, you follow these different persons and they are all kind of frustrated because they are in relationships uh, where their gender doesn't really fit. But yeah. as uh, this, uh, the narrative unfolds and everybody gets a right partner somehow uh, and and things do uh, 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 come out for the better or yeah uh, I, I love the book when I read it and so yes here is a new Greenland yeah. and what I like about it is it has an authentic flair mm -hmm. an authentic Greenlandic flair but it's very universal the topics Absolutely are not just relevant for a small island Inuit community. Exactly. It is, it's universal no matter where you are in the world. It's universal for, uh, I mean, we are uh, somehow in the elite, these people, they are, uh, it's universal for urbanized uh, uh, university students, uh, people who live that kind of life. Yeah, Western-minded, yeah, I, I see that. Um, and, and uh, 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 modern pop music plays such a big role in it. Yeah. Um, uh, I had a student at uh, Elise Madusafik, the University of Greenland, uh, last semester, and she wrote this fantastic um, essay where she really took those um, songs, you know, she, she really interpreted those songs before every chapter, before every yeah. person we follow. There's an opening song and it plays a role. And she dug into that and, and looked into what is in this song and how is the music video? Because mm -hmm. all these young people, they know the music video. And these are not Greenlandic uh, uh, songs, but uh, these English songs, uh, it's, so it's universal for a globalized uh, uh, young elite, maybe, who, who knows all these songs by heart and yeah. know the, the music videos as well. That's very interesting. And the, the question is also, was the writer aware of this when she wrote it to like bring the local and the global together? Yes, Maybe. definitely. 
they had at that time, this was uh, published in 15. Mm -hmm. And before that, she had uh, taken part of a very good initiative in Greenland where they um, they have uh, uh, such a thing they call Asfata, that means let us write. And uh, it's a competition uh, and young people can send in their manuscripts and uh, then the best of them will be selected and they are sent to a booth camp with professional writers. Um, and uh, she had uh, she had been one, one of those 10 uh, selected manuscripts where she wrote another text uh, called San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, those were the years um, where everybody were talking about, you know, uh, Greenlander and globalized and so on. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, it couldn't come at a better time. I, I, I'm sure that um, Greenland is very much on uh, the agenda in Denmark and, and here in at the Scandinavian Studies Department, I remember we talked a lot about the Arctic um, mm -hmm. more broad, broadly, but also the geopolitical um, mm -hmm. importance now that that Greenland has and and you might not have understood for instance when I was growing up um, mm -hmm. and, you know global warming factors into that as well but that's a whole different issue um, but I want to come back to because it ties in with both the a new generation of writers but also what we talked about with nation building how places and communities and identities are constructed when trying to build a I don't know if you can even say build a new identity because I guess that identity has always been there and has been developing. Um, it, it actually, uh, the Greenlandic identity is very, very strong, mm -hmm. uh, but it is um, it, uh, it is um, complex because it's, uh, you know, when when uh, Greenlanders talk about Siuli uh, um, Wood, our forefathers in the plural, then they mean the Inuit. Mm. But when they talk about my profile, my whatever, the family, what, uh, this uh, guy who came from somewhere in Europe, uh, Norway, Denmark, Germany, uh, and who gave the last name, uh, then, then it's a Europeans. So mm -hmm. they have two sets of, of ancestors. And, uh, and the Greenland is actually not called Inuit Nunat, which many people think, and they think it means the land of the human beings. But mm -hmm. but Greenland is called Galatlit Nunat, and Galatlit is an ethnic term, and and the, the Greenlanders usually use it for this mixed uh, population, mixed uh, of European and Inuit. But yeah. in some periods, the ancestors, the Inuit heritage, is valued very highly. That was the case back in the 70s and 80s. Then uh, it was more like, hey, we are globalized, who cares? And now it's very much, you know, with the Inuit tattoos and so on, uh, the interest in all traditions again. I'm so happy about this because when I came to Greenland and was supposed to teach Greenlandic literature, oh, I wanted to teach Greenlandic oral traditions and, and the Greenlandic writers who who use the oral traditions, and they all wanted to read something else, European literature or preferably Latin American literature. Mm -hmm. I was so disappointed, but now <laughs> they want to, to dig into this. Yeah. So, so it, it, it's waves, I think, but they have a very strong uh, uh, Greenlandic identity. Okay, so that also ties with, I guess, wanting independency, like feeling a strong self of, se uh, of self. Yes. This, yes. uh, this time. So how does, um, I will go back to another question I have in a second, but if they, if, if race or like <laughs> being uh, like Inuit with uh, not so much Western blood in you, does that factor in and like, is there a hierarchy within Greenland? Um, actually, you ought to uh, put these questions to Greenlanders. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there is, but you can have many sorts of um, cultural capital. Yeah. Uh, language is definitely one of the most important things. If you speak Greenlandic fluently, then people really don't care so much because okay. obviously so. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but not many Europeans do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then it's also a question about, uh, yeah, uh, if you have relatives who are still hunters, that gives you a lot of capital. If you go hunting yourself, 
that is definitely something if you own a boat, if you know how to use a gun and uh, mm -hmm. all of it. So, so you can collect these. So, so there's not a single answer to this. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. So you were talking about literature. Um, would you tell us about, and you were teaching Greenlandic literature, would you tell us about the traditions of Greenlandic literature and also if they have an, an oral tradition as well? Yeah, um, uh, I would um, just introduce another uh, um, uh, uh, because uh, another uh, author here, Sorena Steinhardt, uh, the same year when uh, Nivia Cornelius published uh, Homo sapiens, he uh, published this Zombie et Nunat, it means uh, uh, the land of the zombies, <laughs> uh, you know, the dead people walking. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and um, it is, uh, that is short stories. And it was actually translated, um, Nivia Cornelius and she writes in both Danish and Greenlandic. Okay. Um, so Steinhardt had uh, Nivia Cornelius and translate this one to, to Danish, but these books are both out there in Danish. And then I want to tell you that, um, that uh, um, Nivia Cornelius actually won the Nordic Council Literature Prize, which is a big thing in, mm -hmm. in Scandinavia. She won that in 2021 for Nasulir uh, that is uh, East Greenlandic for the Valley of Flowers. And I don't think it's translated into, into English, but there is a French translation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, uh, um, and and this is not the first time that the Danish public has been interested in Greenlandic literature. Uh, back in, uh, in the 1982, we got, uh, 82, we got uh, Malia Akave back, uh, and she was born back in 1917. Uh, but, but she published uh, as the first woman publishing a novel in Greenlandic, she published uh, Busi Minabi Nuk. Uh, in uh, 1981, and, and she also translated it herself. Um, and uh, that made a lot of discussion in Denmark. This was also, you know, 1982, that was very close to the um, home rule. Every time there's been one of these changes in the status of uh, Greenlandic policy, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the interest has been uh, much bigger in, in Denmark. Yeah. And as you might uh, detect from the uh, cover here, it's about a woman, one of uh, these women who um, who uh, come to to Denmark with uh, uh, Danish workers, marry a Dane, and and it does not uh, come out so well. <laughs> but it's a very good novel. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's a um, different Busiminat that means the meeting in the bus, and. Um, that covers much more what's going on in the Greenlandic uh, text because it's about uh, an old woman uh, or an older woman uh, who meets a young woman in a bus, they're both Greenlanders. Uh, and uh, the older woman, she doesn't uh, understand why the young Greenlanders are so you know, angry and want to have uh, home rule and so on. But when meeting Katrine and understanding, listening to her stories, she understands. That's genius. Mm -hmm. Also doing it on a bus where you don't usually talk in Denmark. Yeah, and they, they meet there and then uh, Katrine visits her. And for the longest time, she's not really sure if this was a dream. Mm -hmm. and, and that is one of, that's a, it's a very good text. Because you also, you don't really know, actually, this could be the life that she could have had, the yeah. older woman, but she was just lucky. That's what she understands. She's always, you know, we're talking about shame. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Greenlanders, um, very often when they see, you know, um, a drunk uh, a fellow Greenlander on the street, they feel a shame because they'll think, oh, now people think I'm like that too. Mm -hmm. uh, so she used to feel a shame, but uh, and think these people they are they've done it themselves it's their own fault that they are in this situation but what she realizes is this could have been me yeah and then well, another I, uh, now i want to read this book it's, yeah, it's a very good book yeah it's a, the, these two books uh, uh ole corneliusen here he also he's 
uh, recently dead, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, but uh, he is also one of um, the writer, the Greenlandic writers living in Denmark uh, for many years, and and uh, uh, he is highly appreciated by a Danish audience as well. Yeah. Uh, and he also translates his, but but it's not a translation; it's really a, a, a you know rewriting. Um, and and these two bo uh, books, they are not the same in Danish and Greenlandic, while. Nivia Cornelius and Sarina Steenholt, that is more or less the same. It is, it's a translation. It feels like a translation more, yeah. even though it's also rewritten, of course, but, but it's the same text you're reading. It's not these two books, they're not uh, entirely, uh, especially uh, Ole Cornelius's Dacha Sumi Dacha is not the same book as Selstöten uh, 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 in, in Danish. But anyway, so, so we have a tradition for reading Greenlandic authors, but many people don't know they exist, but I mean, that's how it is. Well, that's why we have you today. <laughs> After today, a lot of people will know. Uh, so let me ask you, um, what is a Greenlandic writer? Simple question, but a hard answer, I'm, I'm guessing. It's really hard to, to answer actually, because usually the, the, easy, um, the easy answer will be, that uh, a, a Greenlandic writer is a Greenlander who is uh, writing uh, in Greenlandic uh, for a Greenlandic audience. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's not so easy because uh, it could also be a Greenlander writing both in Danish and Greenlandic for a shared audience. Um, uh, so many Greenlandic writers have been married to Danes, not just now, but Ole Corneliusen here, for instance, he was married to a Dane, Maliak Webeck was married to a Dane. They want their spouses to understand what they are sitting there thinking and writing. So they translate it, and they've always done. Uh, but there are also many Greenlanders who do not speak Greenlandic. They have uh, Danish as their first language. Mm -hmm. uh, due to politics, due to mixed marriages, due to a lot of things. But mm -hmm. but after 1953, many Greenlanders chose, they thought, okay, Greenlandic is such a small language. We want to, you know, uh, uh, have more reading stuff. We want to give our children the best possibilities uh, uh, in the world. So so they shifted and, and only spoke Danish to their, to their children. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. of course, was a mistake. We understand that today, but I mean, well, it um, has been America too. Yeah, yeah, it was very common in America that um, families coming in were told to only speak English to their kids, so they lost that vital part of their identity, um, being able to talk to their families back home, but uh, oh, back in their country of origin, and also have that as part of their identity moving forward. Um, mm. But so. This is interesting, um, also because in, in, in light of uh, a debate that's very strong in America, at least, is if you identify as something, that is what you are. So what yeah. if you identify as Greenlander and you are from Denmark or Somalia or Germany? Um, like, is, the, is it important that we make a distinction? And if so, why? And can we make a distinction in this globalized world where we also look at identities differently than we have before. I think it's difficult because when these things go on in Greenland, it is different. You can say a lot of things about ethnicity in, in Greenland that we couldn't say in Denmark because then it would be uh, racist talk in yeah. a way to talk about our ancestors and that this country is only for us living here. Um, and and the Greenlanders don't do that either. But um, but there are uh, strong nationalist uh, parties in Greenland, just as well as everywhere else. I mean, they have they they don't speak with one voice, mm -hmm. like in Denmark. There yeah. are uh, national right, uh, um, or uh, you can't even talk about right and left in, in Greenlandic politics like that. But there are a strong nationalist voice that would say, um, uh, in Greenlandic for Greenlanders, um, 
Mm. Uh, while others will say uh, no no it's not about ethnicity this is about who is actually living in this country who wants to come here who wants to join who wants to share we want to invite uh, like doctors they need doctors and engineers and so on we want to uh, invite people from abroad if they want to live here and share our our community then that definitely uh, 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 we want people to want to, who want to to be here and make a difference here. Uh, yeah, but that sounds uh, like a global political discussion, right? Remember the the slogan in Denmark, Denmark for Denmark. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. is uh, uh, what we see in Greenland also, yeah. and, and they have just uh, come up with this um, uh, uh, with this uh, 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 preliminary sketch of what a constitution could look like in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it will be heavily discussed also because who are the people, we the Greenlandic people, but who are the people? Do you need to have Inuit's ancestors to feel welcome here and to have a voice and, and a vote and so on? So that is a huge discussion there like everywhere else. But if we want to, I, I, I made this little PowerPoint so that you could have something to look at yeah. apart from me. And I have a slide. I'm sorry. We will just I'll see if I can find this. See, I try to make such a one uh, because we talk about a Danish Greenlandic literature. That would be all these Danish writers who uh, maybe have never been to Greenland. When uh, Peter Hoey wrote Miss Miller's Sense of Snow, he'd never been there. Okay. Uh, so they just write from what they read, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. By other writers and so on. Yeah. And then there is the Greenlandic literature, which is uh, written by people who identify as Greenlanders and who are by other Greenlanders identified as Greenlanders. But then there is uh, this group of grey zone authors, and you mentioned even Montrop before, and I would actually place her there. Like, yeah. yeah uh, like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you would I think you have been reading Justine in this uh, little way. So you, you just showed Goldhound. That was uh, yeah. the book, uh, the novel that she uh, uh, that made her very well known in, in Denmark. This one and, is awesome. And now yeah. everybody are reading um, a, a, a later work, Tabita, Tabita about yeah. uh, an adopted Greenlandic child. But but there have been several, like Sina Rink, she is very famous. And as you can see, she wrote. Uh, her novels uh, around the turn of the past century. And she was also, uh, 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 she was born and raised in, in Greenland. Uh, even Montrop uh, was born in Denmark, but, but uh, raised in, in Greenland. And that certainly makes a difference. First of all, it gives these uh, uh, writers this uh, cultural capital, both within Greenland and and definitely they give them also, they speak with much more authority mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Denmark because uh, they were uh, born and, uh, or, or raised there. Having been a child in Greenland, that gives you a lot of cultural credit, uh, no matter what. And, and you can also, as a reader, feel the difference mm -hmm. because you can feel that they speak they speak from a Danish elite, but they still speak from within the the contact zone. They 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 um, they write from the contact zone, yeah. you know, where different cultures class meet and class and and often in very asymmetrical power relations. They are not equal, but well, but it's yeah. this. I mean, yeah. ling linguistically and like social linguistically, it's it's very it's if you can do that and you can uh, move across not just language groups and cultures, but also, you know, uh, social groups, like it sounds like they do. Uh, right. And you can make yourself understood at, at all these different levels. Um, maybe maybe that's what we need in order to, to understand better. Be I'm, I'm thinking here that if we have a complete, like, um, I'm thinking, I'm, this is a question, I'm getting to it. <laughs> um, Nivia Corneliusen, um, yeah. he sounds very Greenlandic. And I think to many Danes would be a very rough read. Whereas someone who has both cultures and know how to navigate and make it more palatable, maybe to, um, to people outside of Greenland, maybe they can reach 
wider and they might not be they might also be authentic maybe maybe there are layers to authenticity authenticity i don't know what are you thinking i think that even montrop is a rough read too yeah she is she is absolutely if you read uh, tabita that yeah, is i have it's, it's brutal it's actually brutal. a hard novel to read yeah, i true. think so i don't know sine ring she spoke greenlandic Mm -hmm. uh, but even Mandrup was raised at exactly this time when you did not you when people uh, when the children got to school mm -hmm. they uh, put them in different classes so the Danish uh, children were in a Danish class where they only spoke Danish and then uh, the brightest Greenlandic children they were put or the children of the elite they were put in the Danish class and then the rest was put it were put in the Greenlandic class and, and this created of course a hopeless ethnic situation. Yeah. So and she has been writing about that in, in the novel Gulhaun. Yeah. It is a, yes. a, 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 um, a, a, a town up north, Rogadaswak, the big island in uh, in Greenlandic. It's the disco island. Yeah. Well and before going back to my questions, I have to ask because it sounds um, to someone who doesn't uh, speak the language. You you have now said a lot of different words in the language. Do you, are you fluent in Greenland? No, 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 no. Far from it, unfortunately. Um, no, no, no. I'm not, uh, and especially not now. There was a point uh, in time where where I actually saw that ah, I'm you know I'm getting there because I was up in North Greenland and. and it actually went, yeah, I had been in class in Denmark and uh, I had a lot of Greenlandic friends and it went very well. And then I was, um, I became a teacher at Elisimadu Sofik, the University of Greenland. And I very soon realized that my Greenlandic would never be so good uh, that I could teach in the language. And so I kind of gave it up and, and you know, concentrated all my efforts on learning to really read it and understand as much as possible. And um, at that point, you know, uh, entering the university uh, or living in Nook, they all spoke Danish. So I could, mm. and I made so many thoughts and they were laughing and, you know, so I just thought, no, 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 this is it. Now I just uh, learn how to read it. Today, it would make much more sense Today, I could actually find people because after home rule and especially after uh, uh, self-government, there has been this Greenlandization and so many young Greenlanders, um, they want to concentrate their efforts on learning English. So, so today it would have made more sense yeah. for me to really try to, to, uh, um, to learn, to, to really, you know, become comfortable speaking it. Yeah. And for someone who, um, who lived in uh, Estonia for a brief time and tried to learn the language, it's really, it, you have the best intentions, but it can be really hard um, to learn a language that's so far from, from your own native language. And I apologize if anyone can hear um, little sounds, it's my puppy and she's not agreeing to me wanting silence right now. <laughs> um, well, back to the uh, interview. Um, and and time is running. Oh my gosh, time is running. Okay, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll skip to the last question then because I am so fascinated by. I I read um when when uh, preparing, I saw that you have um, written about the indigenous body, the indigenous mm -hmm. female body, and um, I am very interested in um how the body plays a role in this specific literature and also um what it says about the cultural self and women and if we can if you can compare that to the western gaze i.e the danish gaze and what the similarities or probably most differences are i know it's a bunch of questions in one but i <laughs> yeah but um i knew that you were going to to ask that question so uh, the, the all Greenlanders are brought up with all these pictures of Greenlanders and Greenlandic bodies posed in specific situations. And I've been 
uh, very interested in especially the Greenlandic female body because so many uh, uh, Greenlandic writers and and the uh, and the uh, uh, women artists uh, and performance artists have been working with this. But actually, Nivia Corneliusen uh, did a very interesting play called uh, Angutivik. It means a real man or <laughs> uh, something like that. And where she was talking, uh, where she was um, experimenting also the male body and, and all these impressions uh, 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 given to the male body. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, yeah, so so the Greenlanders are uh, born and raised with these uh, references, and and uh, the female body is uh, represented by uh, by the European gaze as this uh, you know the naive but sweet mother. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, as you can see, uh, there's a photograph here by Jette Bang, who was a famous Danish phot uh, photographer. And she is obviously also fascinated by this, the woman uh, carrying her child in the Amat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and when uh, an artist uh, then reproduces it, the woman becomes also eroticized. Yeah. So there's this case that these women are very, very erotic. There are all these stories about how easy it is to uh, have a woman for a night, a Greenlandic woman for a night, because the Greenlandic men, they will just share their women and so on. So they were raised with all these impressions and, and they have then tried to work with that image like, like the, uh, uh, somehow it's easier to show it in pictures. So, mm -hmm. so I'll skip into art now. Pia Arke, uh, made this collage, uh, 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 um, as uh, she called Arctic Hysteria, where you see all these uh, polar explorers wearing all this fur, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are snapshots of eroticized Inuit women. And mm -hmm. Yves Montrop has said that uh, actually uh, by, by doing this, by combining the picture like this, uh, the Arge is uncovering all the hidden dicks, <laughs> <laughs> erected ones uh, of these uh, uh, nice gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, 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 Danish uh, uh, doctors they talked a lot about this Arctic hysteria that would, you know, that these primitive people would have special diseases and so on, and 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 like both men and women would be like. Women, you know, hysteria is the uh, the womb. The, what do you call it? The where you give birth. New uh, more. What is that? The uh, uterus. The uterus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so in a in a in the European case, the uh, uh, the the women were eroticized, and and the uh, and Greenlandic men were to some degree both in infantilized, made into children, yeah. and feminized, uh, because they were supposed to be impulsive and steered by their fantasies and impulses and so on, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the uh, European male who was all, you know, reason and uh, so on and so forth. So so uh, uh, these artists, uh, Jesse Kleeman, who is also a very good writer and actually um, uh, also, one of the the writers uh, who are for her poems read in 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 Denmark, and Pia Arke, who is unfortunately dead. Uh, Pia Arke is uh, uh, um, shown in in all the big galleries now, both in Denmark and internationally. Mm -hmm. But they have been working with this image, trying to you know uh, deframe it, uh, stepping out of this frame where they were put. Uh, as specimens yes. by the uh, European ethnographers and, and tell their own stories. That's fascinating. Very interesting. Um, the very short version of this. <laughs> yes, um, there is a lot to dig into. We could do a whole series just on this. Um, I mean, unless you have something you would like to add to this conversation, I, I feel like we've covered a lot and um, I've asked you a bunch of questions we didn't even prepare for, so I thank you for that as well. Um, do you have any final thoughts? Ooh, I have lots of thoughts, but that must be some other time. <laughs> that must be some other time. 
Well, thank you so much. It's been a delight and it's also been um, very educational. I, I've learned so much and I, I really want to thank you for that. Um, there's so much knowledge I should have that I don't have. So thank you. Um, and before we end, I would like to thank um, the Scan Design Foundation, Northwest Danish Association, Museum of Danish America, Danish American Heritage Society, and Scandinavian Studies Department at the University of Washington. And I also would like to thank our financial um, promotional partners. And um, those are, um, let's see, Elva Hoy Museum, the National Foundation of Danish America, and the National Nordic Museum. Thank you so much for tuning in and see you next time. And thank you again so very much to my guest. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you for having me.